Hey, welcome back to another video on practical electronics and circuits. In this series, I explain the basics of the theory behind circuits with a focus on using this knowledge for actual projects. In today's video, I'll be giving an introduction to signals, which is a fundamental aspect of circuits. Originally, I was planning to talk about resistors and capacitors and how to use them when designing basic circuits. But after thinking about it, I decided it would actually be better to explain signals more in depth before moving on. So I'll be covering resistors and capacitors in my next video. And we'll also be showing how to properly use a multimeter. Then in the following video, I'll be explaining how to use transistors and relays. And at that point, we'll be ready to apply this knowledge to actual projects where we can control things such as lights, motors, and other components from a microcontroller, or a single board computer such as a Raspberry Pi. If you haven't seen the previous video, then I suggest watching it first, since it's helpful to understand the topics covered in that video before watching this one. So as I talked about in the first video, every electrical current will have an associated voltage, current, and resistance value to it. As you can imagine, these properties will change depending on which part of the circuit you're looking at. If you were to measure, let's say, the voltage at various sections of the circuit, then you'd expect to get different readings. After all, that's the point of adding all these resistors, capacitors, and other components. They're there to modify the signal in such a way that it's useful. Now there's a lot of different types of signals. There are boring signals, and then there are more interesting signals. An example of a boring signal is a power rail. If we were to look at, let's say, the 12 volt power rail coming from a computer's power supply, this is an example of a boring signal. For starters, it's a DC signal which means the current only flows in one direction, and will only produce a positive voltage. Unlike an AC signal where the current will change direction and go back and forth, and as a result it will produce a positive and negative voltage. The other reason why a 12 volt power rail isn't very interesting is because ideally its value should never change. In reality it might droop slightly when under heavy load, but a high quality power supply should provide a stable voltage even under load. Keep in mind that the current going through a power rail will change according to what the circuit requires, but its voltage should not change. Now it's crucial to understand when we measure a voltage, we're actually measuring the difference in voltage between two points. The current will always flow from the higher charged point to the lower charged point, and in a power rail these are labeled as the positive terminal and negative terminal respectively. But in DC circuits, the negative terminal doesn't actually contain a negative charge. The negative terminal is used as a reference point, which may or may not be zero volts. But we treat it as zero because all we care about is the difference between two points in relation to each other. In an AC circuit, the current flows back and forth between the positive and negative terminals. So in this case, the negative terminal actually is negative when the direction reverses. But we still need a reference point to designate as zero when measuring these swinging voltages. So that's where the concept of ground comes in. Ground simply gives us a reference point that we use when measuring the circuit's various signals. In the old days they would stick a stake in the ground since the earth provides a path for electrons. So they simply use that as a reference point which is where the term ground comes from. In a DC circuit, the negative terminal is often tied to ground, but not always. Either way, the negative terminal is typically used as the reference point. The terms negative terminal and ground are sometimes used interchangeably. So if you hear someone say to connect a wire to the ground in a DC circuit, they probably mean the negative terminal. But it's important to remember that these aren't always the same thing. Now an audio signal is an example of an interesting signal that carries information since its voltage dramatically changes over time. As opposed to power supply rails which don't change and they aren't meant to convey information. Generally speaking, all the signals in a circuit will fall into one of these categories. 
So again, every single path inside a circuit is considered a signal, and it will either be a signal that changes over time in order to convey information, or it will be a signal that doesn't change at all, and is not meant to carry information, but rather to serve as a reference or act as a power rail. So now let's talk more about signals that carry information. Time is an extremely important concept in signals, so much so that I'm going to go off on a little philosophical tangent here. I'm sure many of you have heard this cliché phrase before that goes something like, everything is just frequencies and vibrations. Well, they're not wrong by making that statement, but they're leaving out a lot of key details which would help to get some sort of useful knowledge out of it. So allow me to explain. Time is necessary in order to convey information. Think about it. If time were to suddenly stop for some reason, then I wouldn't be able to communicate with you anymore, because talking involves words that change over time. I can't really explain anything with just a single word, but rather a series of words that change over time. This same concept actually applies to everything in nature. Sound exists because our eardrums vibrate at the same frequency as the air around us, but the air pressure needs to change over time for this to be possible. And if we were to look at how vision works, the reason why we can see different colors is because of specialized cells in our eyes that react differently depending on the frequency of the light waves that enter the eyes. These electromagnetic waves vibrate at certain frequencies, and frequencies can't exist unless time exists, because frequency tells us the rate at which something is changing over time. I'll talk more about frequency in a second, but just to wrap up this little tangent about everything being vibrations, I think a more accurate statement would be that everything is a form of energy, and the way in which this energy changes over time is what produces information and dictates reality. So, not surprisingly, time is an extremely important aspect of circuits and signals as well. In order to convey information in signals, there needs to be something about the signal that changes over time. While it could be possible to express information in signals by changing the current or resistance over time, Doing this is a lot more difficult than simply changing the voltage over time. The current flowing through the circuit will change according to how much power the circuit requires at that instance, but we don't use current changes to convey information. Information in signals is expressed by the change in voltage over time, and we can plot this information on a graph. The x-axis represents time, and the y-axis represents the amplitude of the voltage. This is the same information that an oscilloscope provides. Scopes are more useful for advanced projects and aren't necessary for the basic projects that I'll be starting off with, but they're definitely something that I'll be talking more about in future videos. Now, oftentimes this change in voltage will be consistent in a way that it produces one or more frequencies. For example, a computer's reference clock will be a crystal or oscillator that operates at a certain frequency. Let's say 100 MHz in this example. Another example could be a simple sine wave audio tone. Let's say 300 Hz. Now the equation for frequency is extremely straightforward. It's simply 1 over time. The length of time it takes to complete a single period is directly related to its frequency. So for our 100 MHz clock example, we can calculate the time it takes to complete one cycle, which would be 10 nanoseconds. And for the 300 Hz sine wave, we can calculate the period to be about 3.33 milliseconds. I'll be talking a lot more about frequency in future videos, since it's an extremely deep topic that's relevant in a large number of scientific and engineering concepts, but hopefully this served as a solid introduction. Now the last thing I wanted to give a quick intro to is analog versus digital signals. As you might have assumed, digital signals are typically associated with computers, but what exactly is the difference between the two? Well, in a nutshell, digital signals can only take on discrete values while analog signals are continuous. 
This means that digital signals only have a set amount of voltage values that they're able to use. The most basic digital signal only has two values and would be considered a 1-bit digital signal. It's either on or it's off. So a 1 indicates on and a 0 indicates off. An example would be a clock in a computer like the 100 MHz clock I just showed a minute ago, or it could be a serial data line that provides communication between two systems. These are classified as square waves and are the most common form of communication between computers. If we wanted to increase the bandwidth of our communications, we could either increase the frequency of the signal or we could add more signal lines. For example, an 8-bit bus would have 8 separate signals, effectively giving 8 times the bandwidth compared to a single serial bus. Analog signals, on the other hand, don't have any limitations like this, since they're a continuous signal. This means that their voltage can take on any value between its minimum and maximum, or in other words, there is an infinite number of values an analog signal can have. If we wanted to, we could continue to zoom in on the signal and subdivide the units of measurement. For example, let's say we measure the voltage with a multimeter to be 5.25 volts at this instance. Well, in reality, this value might actually be 5.2531343 volts or it might be 5.2531344 volts. But in order to get a more accurate reading, we would need extremely sensitive equipment that could measure that accurately. This is why analog signals can be perfectly smooth, unlike digital signals which will have a staircase effect when they try to mimic analog signals. Something to keep in mind is that all signals that are natural or come from nature are analog signals. For example, the sound of someone speaking, the sound of thunder, or the signals that travel throughout an organism's nervous system are a few examples of analog signals. In reality, all signals are analog signals, while digital signals can be thought of as a more restrictive version that follows certain rules and protocols that humans created in order to more reliably communicate information between systems. While digital signals typically only have an on or off state, that's not always the case. We can create more complex digital signals that mimic analog signals by giving more than just two states. If we were able to set the voltage to 16 different values instead of just two, then this would be considered a 4-bit signal. If we increase this to an 8-bit signal, we're now able to set the voltage to 256 different values. And as a result, we can create more complex signals that simulate analog signals. This is how a DAC or digital to analog converter works. An ADC or an analog to digital converter does the opposite. It allows a computer to sample an analog signal at a certain time interval and assign a discrete value at each of these intervals. ADCs are something that I'll be talking about a lot more in future videos as we start to use microcontrollers and projects. Well, that wraps up today's lesson. The topics I covered today were just an introduction, and I'll be talking a lot more about them as we start to apply them to real projects. If you found the video interesting, then be sure to give it a thumbs up, and also consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell notification so you can stay up to date with my videos. Also, if you have any questions, then feel free to ask me in the comments. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys in the next one.